Good evening, everyone. This is a very lively group. <laughs> I'm Madeline Bell, and I'm the president and CEO at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'm pleased to welcome you here uh, to this event and a special recognition. Uh, for many decades, CHOP and the Wistar Institute have been partners in the development of vaccines. In fact, in the 1960s, uh, together we were part of developing the rubella vaccine. And tonight we're here uh, for a very special celebration, our 10-year anniversary of the development of Rotatech. And uh, that, that you have several distinguished people who have been part of that sitting here in the panel, and you'll get to meet them soon. But I do want to say uh, that Dr. Fred Clark, who is no longer with us, um, I want to just recognize him and say he would be part of this panel here, along with um, two other CHOP physicians that are here tonight, Dr. Paul Offit, uh, who is the head of our Vaccine Education Center, an infectious disease doctor, and formerly our ch uh, uh, division chief of uh, infectious disease, along with Dr. Stan Plotkin, who I've also had the privilege to know and work with, and he was previously uh, our division chief of um, infectious diseases, and together the three of them were the uh, developers of the vaccine in partnership with the CDC and Merck. And um, just to think about the impact that this vaccine has had in the last 10 years, and I was even talking earlier, I remember 10 years ago, we were doing all kinds of calculations to look at the impact it would have on our inpatient census, and we were probably just a little bit worried we'd have a lot of open beds. But when you look at the last um, 10 years, uh, hospitaliz hospitalizations for children uh, having rotavirus have dropped 85%. Uh, in this time period. And then if you look at the potential impact globally, um, an another 180,000 kids around the world uh, could be saved by this vaccine if we were able to uh, distribute it com uh, completely across the, across the world. And thinking about sort of the global impact, I'd like to also say that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been so instrumental in ensuring that the vaccine is available to those who most need it in developing countries. Um, in recognition for the work that Drs. Clark, Offit, and uh, Plotkin had um, on, on CHOP and the, the impact they've made, they were awarded in 2006 with CHOP's Gold uh, Medal Award, which was our highest uh, award available. And I'm just honored to be here uh, with them and all of the people who are a part of this, and most importantly, with our partners at the Wistar Institute. So thank you so much, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of Wistar, Dr. Dario Altiari, who we met a couple minutes ago. Thank you so much, Madeline. It's a, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to uh, moderate the panel tonight. I, uh, as I said this morning, the best part about it is that I don't really know anything about vaccines, <laughs> but I have these individuals here that can uh, certainly enlighten me. And, uh, I think one of the themes, one of the themes for tonight is that uh, the development of such a successful drug and safe drug that has really shaped um, the lives of countless individuals and countries as well is really a part of collaboration and partnership. The private sector, the public sector, research institutes, and government agencies. And maybe to get things started, maybe I can ask Umesh a little bit of the uh, what this meant, really, that the discovery and development of Rotatech, what this meant from the perspective of the Center for Disease Control. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And for, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Umesh Parashar. I'm at the Centers for Disease Control uh, with the Viral Gastroenteritis Unit. Our group was involved in developing the guidelines and recommendations for Rotatech. You hear me okay at the back now? Yeah. <laughs> I can try and hold it up. Is this better? Okay. And I, you know, I've known uh, Stanley, Paul, and Penny for a long time, and I'm delighted at least to be here to celebrate their, their outstanding achievements. Uh, for rotavirus, and I think I should say this, even though many of you in the audience know this, but even perhaps some of you who are currently training in pediatrics, uh, with the substantial impact of the vaccine may not realize this was before vaccine introduction the leading cause of severe diarrhea in young children around the world. No matter where you looked, anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of hospitalizations for diarrhea were from rotavirus. So a vaccine was really needed 
Uh, globally, as was mentioned, there were an estimated half a million deaths from rotavirus. In the US, we fortunately don't have, didn't have many deaths because of good access to care, but still there was a huge burden on morbidity from hospitalizations, about 55,000 each year, half a million outpatient visits, and over 250,000 emergency department visits. So vaccine development for this pathogen has been a priority for several decades. I should also mention Prior to Rotatech and Rotarix, which are currently available, we had another vaccine, which some of you also may remember in the late 90s, uh, which was recommended for routine use in US children. And then it was withdrawn less than a year after its implementation because it caused intersusception, a uh, form of bowel obstruction. And so we went through a really tough period, many of us who were in the field and excited about these vaccines, uh, with the loss of Rotashield, and as these new vaccines were going through clinical trials, and I was just telling Penny, it's such a remarkable achievement to conduct these trials in the face of all the uncertainty, both from the science part, but the economic uncertainty, the concerns from parents, and the fact that these vaccines both came out and showed remarkable success uh, has been truly, truly phenomenal. And I, I, I mean, as was mentioned for the US, uh, I still remember we had our first evidence of vaccine impact in 2008, which was two years after Rotatech was implemented in the US. And most remarkably, we had almost an absence of rotavirus that year. And it was only a year after the vaccine was rolled out. And, Many of us who were looking at the data real time as it was coming in just could not believe this was from vaccine because by that time only the under one children in the US had been vaccinated. So you really wouldn't expect such a phenomenal impact across the older age groups as well. And I recall that when that happened, I called up our, our colleagues in Canada and Mexico and said, are you still seeing rotavirus or is it just wiped off from, from, from the North American continent? And they, they said, no, we are still seeing plenty of rotavirus. So that actually was reassuring and it, it prompted us to put out our first report on vaccine impact. And it also, I think, in, in retrospect over in the next two years, we realized that the vaccine was not only benefiting vaccinated children, but older children who were not vaccinated were actually seeing a reduction in disease because it was interrupting transmission of rotavirus at the population level. In fact, we even have data that even in the elderly, we've seen a decline in gastroenteritis, which was a surprise because we never thought rotavirus was a problem in, in elderly individuals. We never had disease surveillance data. The vaccine as a probe really showed that the, the disease was a problem in older people. So the impact in the US for the past decade has just been phenomenal. The number of children who have who have avoided hospitalization, emergency room visit, outpatient visit is, is in the millions by now. Uh, what's even more exciting, I think, is we are now seeing data on vaccine impact from its global use. Uh, the first country, the first low-income country to introduce Rotatech was Nicaragua. And what was remarkable, again, is it happened in the same year, the introduction in Nicaragua as in the US. It was a program where Merck donated the vaccine for a three-year period for the full uh, childhood cohort in Nicaragua, and they have since continued vaccination. So we had almost an unprecedented achievement where you had the vaccine being implemented in a rich country and one of a low-income country in the same calendar year. And we saw some very remarkable impact in Nicaragua. More recently, over the past four or five years, we've had a lot of introductions in Africa, and we have seen really remarkable impact in places like Rwanda, which has uh, been one of the first introducers of Rotatech in, in Africa. We have seen almost a 30, 40% reduction in diarrheal disease hospitalizations. And if you look at even all-cause childhood hospitalizations, before the vaccine was implemented, about 20% were from diarrheal disease, so one in five. Now it's down to one in 10. 
So the, the impact of these vaccines has truly been phenomenal. And when I heard of this event happening, I said, I have to go to celebrate this achievement with my friends. <laughs> Thank you, Mesh. I, I'd like to now turn to the, um, to the people that actually got this thing uh, going. And if I got the timeline right, um, the thought, the concept, the idea of developing a vaccine uh, against rotavirus started with, with Stan and Paul, obviously, back in 1980. I know it sounds ominous, but it's, uh, that's uh, like a long time. So, um, no offense. Uh, uh, so, so uh, to, the, to, to Stan and, and Paul, how did it work? I mean, I mean, Paul, you probably were a fellow or a resident back in the I was about 15 years old. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just, you know, I thought you were in training, but I didn't say that you were in high school. But. So uh, how did that come about? I mean, one day you woke up and said, gee, you know, I should probably start working on a vaccine for rotavirus. How did it go? No, um, you know... <laughs> How old were you? you know, uh, <laughs> well, I was about 20 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, actually, the, the, let me say right up front that the smartest thing I did was to recruit uh, Fred and Paul uh, to, uh, uh, to do the rotavirus uh, project. But, you know, science is a cum cumul cumulative endeavor. And it's seldom that ideas spring f um, uh, from uh, Jove's head like Athena. It, it's, it, it's something where the discovery of rotavirus in Australia uh, led, of course, to the realization that rotavirus was a major pathogen. And the people at NIH, in particular Al Kapikian, uh, started to work on rotavirus and on rotavirus uh, vaccine uh, has has already been mentioned um, uh, that ran afoul of a uh, unfortunate complication of vaccination and was uh, eventually withdrawn but the uh, the timeline as far as I recall and I'm sure my memory is faulty in some respects the timeline was that uh, I recognized early in the 80s that this was a potential for a uh, vaccine. And uh, Fred Clark at the time had been working on rabies at, at Wistar, but uh, that was already accomplished. The rabies vaccine uh, was done in the, in the 70s. Uh, and uh, Paul came as a fellow. Now, you have to understand, he was a brash young man with a beard. Uh, and, uh, but I recognized uh, his potential. <laughs> so He's blushing. <laughs> a lot. So, so in, in, the, in the 80s, um, I uh, convinced the people at Sanofi Pasteur that they should uh, help fund the development of a rotavirus vaccine. Now, that's a good example of the faulty judgment of um, people, uh, uh, not just in the industry, but in this case it was in the industry, because they lost interest uh, at a certain point in, in the 80s when we were developing the basic uh, background for vaccine development, which started, as I recall, about 1985. And um, uh, then it was a matter of eventually convincing um, Merck, which Paul uh, was very instrumental in, uh, to pick up the vaccine development. So I, I just want to say that vaccine development is not easy, and it's, it's, it's not only the scientific issues, it's also the issues of uh, proving or convincing the world that it's worth developing a vaccine and worth putting an effort into it. It is calculated that a licensed vaccine costs about half a billion dollars. 
Now, I'm not, this is not to excuse or to justify the profits of companies, but they have to invest enormously into vaccine development. Fortunately, um, what is Rodatech today uh, was uh, developed. Uh, uh, Fred um, found a bovine virus, which after many permutations uh, eventually proved to be the basis of the uh, vaccine. And uh, the scientific studies that Paul did obviously contributed tremendously to um, the eventual licensure and development of the vaccine. Uh, but before turning it over to Paul, let me say that the people at Merck also d uh, worked enormously uh, to make a licensed vaccine, which is different from something that you do in the laboratory uh, on a bench. So, Paul, let me turn it over to you. Sure. I, you know, it's not, uh, I mean, it's, when I came to, uh, to Children's Hospital, I, it's, uh, I was a first-year fellow. I mean, my, I did a clinical year, and then the second year I was trying to decide what to do. I mean, so I chose rotavirus because it had only been known to be a human pathogen at that point for about eight years. It, there, there was a lot that what wasn't known about immunogenesis and pathogenesis. <laughs> the veterinarians had known that this was a disease back really starting from the 40s, but the, the, the animal models that were used were all large animals, you know, sheep, pigs, goats, so they weren't genetically defined, so it would be very hard to do studies of immunogenesis. We, I mean, my interest was just in survival I mean, I, I just wanted to be able to, to you know, to, pu to do studies that were, were publishable and get my grants. I mean, although the first paragraph of the grant always said that, you know, that rotavirus is an important disease in the United States and worldwide, I never really believed that we were making a rotavirus vaccine. I mean, I, I Stan did because he'd already made one. I mean, he made the RE27-3 of rubella vaccine, so he'd taken something from beginning to end. I mean, I hadn't and was just trying to survive. But I would like to say one thing, though, about Fred. When I first uh, came to to, to uh, Wistar, or to, uh, to, to CHOP, and I was, I was here in Walter Gerhardt's lab doing, doing monoclonal antibody work and also our animal work. Um, but I, I was trying to decide what, what to go into, and I talked to, for, to, to Stan, and Stan said, you should talk to Fred about rotaviruses. And so I met Fred for the first time, and he, he was, I don't know, for those of you who know Fred, he was a, a uh, sort of a very tall, lanky, witty man who, who sort of brought me into his office and was talking endlessly about the disease in the developing world. I mean, he really had an enormous heart and, and, and uh, wanted this, saw this as a way to, to, to save lives in the developing world. And, and while I was talking to him, first of all, the fact that is that in his, his uh, lab, he had a number of snakes in jars, you know, because he was, he was a herpetologist virologist. And so already it had this kind of Adam's family feel when I walked into his lab. <laughs> um, and then while I was talking in his office, this is sort of a typically academic, small, book-filled office, there was a picture of Dag Hammarskjöld over his desk. And, and, you know, Dag Hammarskjöld was, uh, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations, actually had won, one, probably one of the few people to win the Nobel Prize posthumously. But I kept thinking, who the hell has a picture of Dag Hammarskjöld <laughs> over their desk? So he, he was just, he was a very interesting man, very different from what I'd ever known, and certainly seduced me into, into doing this. And frankly, without, obviously without him and Stan, who led this program, this would have never been a vaccine. But like in all, the, all, all scientific endeavors, you know, at least for me, I was just trying to, to do the studies that I thought, you know, would enable us to learn about the virus and hopefully contribute, as Stan said, to this global effort to try and make a vaccine. But that we made it, I think, was just an enormous amount of luck and also my luck mm -hmm. being with people just as talented as Stan and Fred. So, so and then now, Penny, you know, going back a little bit to your previous life uh, at Merck, you, know, you, you, you hear these people and they, they make it sound easy, right? Oh, we just had to convince Merck to, 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 to make the vaccine. And it sounds like, you know, it's something that you discuss over coffee or something like that. But you, unless I'm mistaken, you actually have to build an entire plant to make a vaccine. I mean, talking about, talking about investment. So how did it work? Yeah, so... Um does everyone have their pajamas? Because this is a long story. <laughs> and so first, I'd just like to say it's such an honor to be here on behalf of the Merck team. I see all of the people in the audience who were such, so critical in bringing this vaccine to licensure. And I just, it's very humbling for me to be here speaking when I, when I see everyone else here who was so critical to this. But, um, you know, Merck uh, licensed the vaccine in, in 1991, and um, the development was actually quite long. I mean, the vaccine was not licensed until 2006. 
So what is involved in development and licensure of a vaccine? So the first thing we did was a study to confirm that the vaccine uh, worked. And uh, the, the study was done in you know, 1993, 1994, a study of 400 patients, and it did show that the vaccine worked. In fact, it prevented 100% of severe disease and 75% of, of any rotavirus disease. So that was really exciting. So what happened next? Merck stopped the program. <laughs> <laughs> and why did they stop the program? Because Merck wanted the best, and Merck was, and you know, the president of Merck Research Lab said, you know, we have to have a liquid, fully liquid formulation that you can just give to the kid in one squeeze of the tube. We cannot have this be complicated. We can't compete with the other rotavirus vaccine. We're stopping the program. So it stopped. However, thank goodness there were a couple of scientists. Alan Shaw is one of them. I don't know if I guess he's not here tonight but who kept the work going and kept working on the liquid formulation. And so after they got it figured out, they brought it back to Ed, I think probably very nervously. <laughs> and uh, they brought it back to the president of Merck Vaccines and said, you know, we figured it out. Can we restart the program? This was in 1997. And so that approval was given and the program moved forward with a couple of different studies. First of all, um, looking at different formulations of the vaccine, and then secondly, figuring out exactly what dose needed to be given. And uh, in true pharmaceutical fashion, then the um, guidance was, you need to go faster. <laughs> and, so, uh, the, uh, and so, in fact, one of the ways to go faster was to go on and take the risk of build, starting to build the manufacturing facility even before all of the phase two and phase three efficacy data were available. So ground was broken on the manufacturing facility in 1998. The final decision was made to, uh, on, the, on the manufacturing process. A ton of work had been done. And, and that decision was made. So 1999 is when I entered the picture. I was at the Centers for Disease Control, an epidemic intelligence service and, uh, officer in the foodborne and diarrheal diseases branch. I investigated outbreaks of diarrhea, and I also had a long-term study ongoing in Kenya looking at diarrheal diseases in infants born to HIV-infected mothers. And uh, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do at, you know, towards the end of the two years, and I had decided, okay, I want to go into public health or back into academia or stay at the Centers for Disease Control, and I will live anywhere in the world except the Northeastern US. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? I get an email from a recruiter uh, who said, you know, there's a diarrheal disease vaccine at Merck. You know, would you be interested in, uh, in the position? And uh, so, it, it was, so I, I, I went for a visit. Then I actually went back to Kenya and I uh, got the final results of the study there. And um, the study showed I followed 467 kids for two years. At the end of the study, 52 had died. 26 had diarrheal disease at the time of death and 26 had pneumonia at the time of death. And so I was you know, trying to think of what do we tell these, these mothers, these parents, how, what do we tell them to, to do for, for, their, for their kids who are dying of diarrheal disease? So I got back, made another visit to Merck and said, aha. This is what we can do. You know, we can make a rotavirus vaccine uh, that can prevent these deaths. Uh, so I'm ready to go to Merck, and a week before I was supposed to start at Merck, I was at CDC on my computer one day, you know, doing my emails, and there was an announcement that came out uh, that was sent over the email that said, there's an investigation of a side effect with the current rotavirus vaccine that is ongoing, side effect called intussusception that Umesh already alluded to. And uh, you know we are, are going to be investigating this. We don't have any um, uh, recommendations at this point, but we are forming a team to investigate. So I called um, my new boss and uh, said, Jerry, you know, do I still have a job? What are you doing with, the, with your all's rotavirus vaccine program? Is it moving forward? And uh, he um, said, oh, this isn't going to affect our vaccine program. Come on. Yes, yes, everything's going to move forward as usual. Come on, come on down. Uh, so um, I started at Merck the next week. And within three weeks of my starting, uh, the current vaccine was no longer recommended. And we had to decide how to move forward with the program. 
And I must say, it was an incredible effort. You know, I, I only knew enteric vaccines, I had only seen three cases of and bacterial enteric vaccines. I had only seen three cases of venesusception in my whole life. And so, you know, really relied on, um, on Paul and Stanley and, and Fred and all of my colleagues at Merck. And, you know, we made the decision to move forward with the vaccine, with the, with the development of the Merck vaccine, uh, because there were biological differences in that vaccine and the, and the other vaccine, but more importantly, because of the severe burden of rotavirus disease. You know, it was killing 500,000 kids a year and uh, causing, you know, 70,000 hospitalizations in the U.S., 100 deaths in the U.S. And so we made that decision uh, to move forward. We did not have any indication of inisusception in, in the current data from the rotavirus vaccine trials, so we did. But, you know, when I, when I got the job, I thought I was going to be doing a 3,000 patient phase three trial. <laughs> and instead, uh, you know, inisusception, the side effect, it, it's uncommon. So in order to actually show the safety of the vaccine, we needed to do a very large trial. So we moved forward with a 70,000 patient trial, uh, 70,000 infants, <laughs> 6 to 12 weeks old, uh, and in fact, uh, we have some statistics on that trial, or some figures, I should say. So the, patient, the, the babies, if you put them in the link here in Philly, uh, they would, is it still called the link? It's probably called something else by now. But anyway, uh, if you put them in the stadium, it would overflow the stadium. That's how many babies it was. Um, we, um, there, was there were over 9 trillion Vero cells used to make the vaccine for that trial. The vaccine vials would have stretched longer than five miles, and the case report forms that were used to collect the data would have stood and did stand taller than the Sears uh, building in Chicago with, with the antenna on the top. So, you know, it really, it, it takes a company like Merck to make that kind of commitment and commit that kind of resources uh, to, to um, uh, to moving the vaccine forward, and of course we had the manufacturing facility was was already was already built. Uh, continued to move forward with you know as soon as we got interim data, continued to move forward with validating the manufacturing process, moving forward uh, with development of the vaccine, which was ultimately uh, licensed and approved by uh, the um, FDA and and recommended by the advisory committee on immunization practices. Uh, in 2006, so it was it was just an incredible, incredible experience. Uh, as Joe Hayes was saying earlier tonight, it wasn't just a once in a lifetime experience; it was like a once in a hundred lifetimes experience. And um, you know, and before I left Merck, we also they committed to getting the vaccine made available to children in the developing world. So uh, I traveled with um, Pat, Kathy Newzel at Path, Duncan Still at WHO. A lot of support from UMass and the CDC to get uh, the studies up and going in the developing world. Uh, and then I left it to my colleagues who I knew would take it forward and, and went on to other things. Uh, but what was really amazing this year, just a few months ago, um, one of my colleagues at the foundation sent me the Rwanda article and uh, showing the incredible impact of the Rotatec vaccine in Rwanda and the amazing reduction in hospitalizations for uh, diarrhea and the herd effect. And um, I just sent him a note back and said, I'm gonna cry, this is just <laughs> such an amazing thing to finally see this. So, um, you know, thanks, it was, it was just incredible. And thanks, thanks to Merck and their commitment and uh, their devotion of resources to make this possible. When, just one quick story about Penny. When, when, um, when that vaccine was, when we broke the, the, the code on the big phase three trial, the one that Penny just described, uh, Penny had her demonstration for Upper Gwynedd for the, for the 200 people that were, were uh, at Merck to talk about what they had just found, which is that you know, the, the vaccine worked and was safe. So she's standing up in front of 200 people now in Upper Gwynedd, and she shows a series of slides. That was your famous cat in the hat demonstration. But <laughs> she had a slide that had a map of the world, and on that map there were individual black dots, each black dot representing 1,000 deaths a year from rotavirus. And so the Africa, Asia, Latin America was studded with black dots. And she said, this is what rotavirus does now. She says, now we have in hand the technology to do this. And she shows the next slide where all those black dots are gone. And then in front of 200 people, she put her head down and wept. 
in front of all of us. And I think it's an image that no one ever has of a pharmaceutical company. You know, that, that, that this, this heart, you know, this really caring to try and get it right. They're the only ones that have the resources and, and uh, expertise to do this and the people to do this. And it's just those people, you know, are us. And uh, that was Penny. Yeah, you know, as, as we were saying, they just <coughs> convinced Merck to do it. I mean, that's a... <laughs> so Stan, you know, the, the, going back to you for just a second, you know, there's a nice picture of you uh, hanging on one of the walls here at Worcester where you <clears throat> forcefully hold down the then director, Dr. Hilary Koprowski, while he's getting injected with something. I don't know what it is. Yeah. And so, and so you know, uh, rotavirus is certainly not the only vaccine you've been working on while you were at Worcester and the CHOP. So was that any, any different from the other vaccines that you've been working on, rubella, measles, anything special? Well, in a way, that's a difficult question because, um, you know, I... <laughs> continue to, um, uh, to go from one thing to, uh, to another. Uh, now my, my current interest is a virus called cytomegalovirus, which does the things that Zika does, but it does it constantly every year, and it's not as well known as, as, as Zika. So, you know, I, I think I guess I like to go from one problem to the, to the next. Uh, I, it, just uh, another anecdote at the party that Merck had after rotavirus licensure, I said that I have the impression that I've spent all my life working for Merck because uh, they produce uh, the vaccines that, that I was interested in. Uh, rabies was a problem of uh, inferior vaccines, that is, vaccines that weren't always protective and uh, were um, caused side reactions, you know, going back to Louis Pasteur. Uh, but uh, Hillary, uh, together with other people at Wistar, uh, Leonard Hayflick and, and others, uh, were interested in developing a, a better one. Uh, and uh, without going into the technical details, a key issue was how you grow the virus. And uh, at that time, um, uh, together with uh, uh, Tad Victor and, and uh, Len Hayflick, we uh, adapted the virus uh, to human cells uh, so that we could make a vaccine that was both safe uh, and effective. And so anyway, um, I've had um, a, a nice life because I've seen things happen uh, to the best that uh, I did not entirely uh, expect. And indeed, Umesh already mentioned one of them. I had really no optimism that a rotavirus vaccine would give such herd immunity as it has. Uh, and so that was a very positive result that I didn't expect. So. Uh, in this field, you have to um, uh, think like an optimist, even if you're a pessimist. <laughs> and so I, I'm certainly uh, grateful for the things that have happened to me. I, I could not ask for um, a, um, what shall I say, a, a better way to spend my life. And so going, going back to Penny, you know, Penny, I, by training, I'm a hematologist, oncologist, and, and uh, one of the things we complain, not sure who's we, but I guess me <laughs> and my college, but one of the things we complain that when we think about relationships between academia and industry is that nowadays it feels that industry has retrenched, has... Uh, has developed a very risk-averse mentality, um, where early-stage discovery is seen as uh, too risky, too dangerous, too expensive, prone to failure. All things that, that are true in the, in the oncology world, um, bringing an agent to the clinic has an estimated price tag of $1.5 billion. And so 
What is the outlook for industry now in terms of vaccine biology and vaccine development, in terms of risk taking? What is the next, uh, what is the next wave that we're going to be looking at? Yeah. So it's a great question and one that I've been pondering quite a bit lately. In fact, I was sharing with Mike that uh, I actually just had a consulting group look at the pharmaceutical industry and history of vaccines starting, I made them start all the way back in the late 1800s and had them actually do the research all the way through to you know the, the current day and project what's going to happen 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. You know, I'd love to be in a world where by 2040, and this is a vision that I've said and my team is still working on that, where, where everyone who, who needs a, a vaccine against an infectious disease is, and a, against an infectious disease is, is getting it, um, regardless of where they live uh, in the world. And um, so, you know, my, what we're pondering at the foundation is how can we make that a realization? I do think there are some some near-term opportunities that are really exciting that are actually good for both the rich world and the poor world. And I think, you know, let's let's start there. You know, let's continue to work on getting rotavirus to all the children in the world who need it. Let's continue to work on getting pneumococcal conjugate vaccine to all the children in the world who need it. New vaccines that are coming, I think the maternal immunization platform is really exciting. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus is the leading cause of hospitalization in the U.S., uh, in, leading infectious cause of hospitalization in the U.S., and we know it's a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the developing world as well. So that's something we can work together on that would benefit both the rich world and the poor world, so let's figure out a way to do that. And um, what we've been doing at the foundation is really thinking about working together with our pharmaceutical par partners earlier so that we can look at product characteristics and try to align as closely as possible so when that vaccine is ready for the rich world, it's also ready for the poor world and we don't have a gap in introduction while we try to retrofit what was made for the rich world back to fit the poor, poor world, but that things can actually be launched simultaneously. So do we have that, that opportunity now with respiratory syncytial virus? Do we have that opportunity now with group B strep vaccine? So I think that's where we start. I think it gets harder when we start to look at vaccines that are just for the poor world. When we start to look at things like malaria vaccine uh, or TB vaccine or HIV vaccine, which still would be for, for both the rich and poor world, but I think those are harder. And you know, where the foundation, what we're doing, I mean, one of the things that we do as we look at how can we de-risk, if you will, um, new technologies that are really, high risk technologies that could potentially be transformative. You know, what can we do to help work with our partners and the pharmaceutical industry, our partners within the global health vaccine community to de-risk those technologies, to get them to the point where there's proof of principle, so then our pharmaceutical partners could help take them on and um, develop them. Um, I will say that, you know, one thing being at the foundation has done, it's really taught me to appreciate what I call the development engines, if you will, of the vaccine industry and, and, and the pharmaceutical companies. There is no place else in the world where that development happens. And so we have to figure out a way to work together to continue to provide the vaccines that are so needed for uh, the developing world. You know, what are the incentives, if you will, that, that will work for both sides, you know? Is it is de-risking the technology enough, and then and, and helping with the development costs? Is it going to take more than that? Is it going to take a more advanced market commitments? So those are the things we were working on. I don't have an uh, you know a direct answer. I think what we need to do is keep the dialogue open and really figure this out because the stakes are too high. There's you know there's there's too many deaths from HIV, TB, malaria. Uh, there's too much need uh, for good development of high quality, safe, efficacious uh, vaccines. We can't let it go, so we have to figure out a way to make this happen. Uh, I'd like to comment on, on that, um, but first of all, it's something I've been meaning to say uh, all day, and that is that the, the, the WISTAR is a remarkable institution. I came here in 1957, and the thing about it was that 
there were no barriers between laboratories. Everybody was willing to work together. And that you could do your science without worrying about other things, so to speak. And that, that is a remarkable fact, a, a place where basic research can be done in an atmosphere which is very, very positive. So I just wanted to say that in passing. But as far as uh, what Penny was just talking about, I am uh, currently deeply involved in something called CEPI, which uh, the idea of which is that we have epidemic diseases occurring from time to time, like Ebola and Zika and, and others. And we have no way of preparing vaccines in advance of epidemics and having them ready when epidemics occur. And the idea is to create a global fund that would allow pharmaceutical companies, uh, would, would, let's say, give them grants to develop vaccines that they wouldn't ordinarily develop because the, they couldn't anticipate a market for those vaccines. Now, if that comes into being, which we will know within a year, basically, uh, I think it would go a long way to solving the problem of uh, missing vaccines, vaccines that we should have, but we don't have in hand when an emergency occurs. And so this is a great segue. Uh, Umesh, this is, you know, from, from what Stan is saying and what we read in the, in the newspapers and we hear on television, there are a lot of threats out there. There are a lot of emerging threats, some that we know, some that we think we know. Uh, what is your perspective and the perspective of the CDC? Are we prepared? So, I, I mean, I think clearly, as Stan said, there are, there are uh, and, and these threats are largely unpredictable, and unless, it's, unless you're ahead of the curve, it's hard to prepare for them. For things like Ebola, we've had Ebola epidemics now for over 40 years. Still, it's hard to have an Ebola vaccine ready to deploy in the event of an outbreak because you just don't know when it's going to happen. And for a pharmaceutical company to invest in the development of a product, there's a big risk in the concept that Penny mentioned of trying to find ways where you deleverage that risk where if a company does invest, they can there's some financial incentive as well to make that investment, which is critically important even in addition to the public health issues. Coming back to rotavirus, though, for example, you know, this, uh, I wanted to elaborate on this uh, point that Penny made, and a great example of the kind of work Gates Foundation has done to encourage other vaccines for rotavirus being developed worldwide. There is a need for additional candidates. We do have the two big licensed multinational vaccines from Merck and Glaxo, but still there is a supply shortage for the global market and so we need additional manufacturers. There are economic issues where some of the countries can't afford even though the prices for the two international vaccines have been subsidized quite a bit. They are still uh, somewhat unaffordable in some settings, so having cheaper vaccines is of value. Uh, there are concerns with oral vaccines in general that they perform less well in developing settings. So other approaches are being tried to develop uh, inactivated or other parenteral approaches that would potentially have better performance in the developing world, sort of analogous to inactivated polio vaccine in addition to oral polio. So these vaccines are needed for and fortunately, there is a lot of interest in the global community in developing country manufacturers to develop such vaccines. The big challenge is they don't have the deep pockets to, to really fund the development and research in the clinical trials that are needed. And a great example of how the international community can facilitate the process has been the development of a rotavirus vaccine that was launched in India last year. It's been introduced in India in four states initially, which are about the size of four countries anywhere in, in the world, but it, and is slowly going to be introduced across the whole country. That would not have happened without the international community supporting that vaccine. The company that developed it 
was a brand new company. I went and visited the, the plant in 2000 and they were literally just building the, the plant there. It was a structure of steel and concrete. The person who went back to make that company was in the States for 14 years as a, as a PhD laboratory researcher and went back and had this grandiose idea that I would that his company would start developing vaccines so there was not a lot of expertise and resources but there was the heart and will to do it and the resources for that vaccine development largely came from the international community the Gates Foundation the Indian government invested in it and the scientific resources came from a scientific consortium that guided the whole development of the process, the trials, and, and led to the successful development of the vaccine. So I think as, as Penny was mentioning, for many of these uh, emerging threats and conditions, particularly ones that may not have a direct impact on developed countries where there's a commercial market for the vaccine, finding ways to really uh, finance the development and encourage the development of vaccines through alternative approaches will be critical and the Indian vaccine for rotavirus is a great example so I'm delighted that Penny took her energy and, and her desire to, to better the world to the foundation and she'll have a lot of impact from that front as well. Yeah, well Just uh, switch gear for a second. Uh, David, you, you, you've taken uh, the work that these people have done and the work that other people have done and you just turn it upside down and uh, have invented uh, a new way of making vaccines, of thinking about vaccines and producing vaccines. Uh, I think that the one word that you like to use to describe your own work is disruptive. And so, uh, how is that, that going to be? That was my personality. I really did not. I know, I know. <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to be nice. And, and So how is that going to disrupt the way we think about vaccine? The way, because it's not just one vaccine, right? Your laboratory is contributing really a platform, a model. How is that going to change the way we think about vaccines? We pay for vaccines and we develop vaccines? Well, um, well first I'd just like to say that it's humbling to be on this panel with Umesh, uh, Penny, uh, Paul, and of course Stanley, and uh, they have all gotten something across the goalposts um, and, and really um, significantly contributed to lowering morbidity and mortality um, uh, in this, in rotavirus, and of course in, in others as well. So, so um, our stuff is much newer than that, so I do want to point that out. And I'm just uh, grateful to be uh, able to sit here uh, with them. Um, so our uh, almost uh, 28 years ago, in uh, when I was first at Wistar and uh, had a joint appointment with Penn, um, I was a pretty lousy um, molecular biologist virologist and um, I had a lot of trouble with the platform of the day which was going to change vaccines which was um, recombinant pox viral vectors and um, they took a long time and picking them and purifying them and making them and so um, I one day sat down and charted out all the th things I want to accomplish with these vaccine experiments and I realized I'd be long dead before I ever got anywhere with this platform and um, so I needed something different and uh, after uh, a while uh, we decided to focus on just delivering pure DNA as a potential vaccine and and this idea was not popular at first but S Stanley, uh, Maurice, Hillerman and uh, later when I talked to Paul were all <laughs> extremely encouraging even though this was uh, a very weird idea. And um, we were able to successfully treat mice, uh, but when we moved it into the clinic uh, with guidance from Maurice Hilleman, um, it was about as immunogenic as water. And, and so at that point, which was already eight years into this project, uh, Stanley, who said he's an, he has to be an optimist, even a pessimist, was very encouraging. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it took a while, uh, 
and it took a while to get grants, it took a while to get people interested, but the idea was a non-live, non-spreading, something that you didn't have to grow in mammalian culture would really change many, many things. In theory, it would be very cheap. It could be stable for distribution in the developing world. It could be rapidly produced. You don't have to grow anything. And um, I guess the best uh, exa example would be recently, uh, we had some success in an FC trial uh, directed by Mark Bagarazzi, who also collaborated with Penny at Merck on the uh, rotavirus vaccine as a regulatory um, oversight. And um, Mark oversaw a trial of one of these DNA vaccines, a much more modern one, uh, where uh, efficacy was reached in treating women with early cervical disease. Um, and we also were then able to uh, move that into testing another concept, which was uh, in the Ebola outbreak. There were two vaccines, and we were approached by the government to make a third because there were side effects with the first two, and they wanted a backup. It turned out those turned out to be less than they need to worry about, but ours still moved forward and showed very reproducible immunology. And so the most recent thing was with a Zika outbreak, um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Gary Kobinger, called up in the fall and, and said, you know, your platform is perfect for this. We don't really know what to do. It's really early, and we don't have an animal assay. We don't have a way to even think about building a lot of these vaccines. And we have no neutralization assay as of yet. Uh, but DNA has a very straightforward path, and you've established safety in these other platforms. And so we were able to move forward a, an experimental Zika vaccine, I think in the shortest period of time, from nothing to being in the clinical trial, checking off uh, boxes of protecting animals, um, safety, and um, reproducible manufacturing options with uh, collaborators. So we'll look forward to seeing how those play out. And I, I'm hopeful that, uh, I mean, one of the great things about the vaccine field is the support and the way I sort of just described that people in, in industry, in public health, and at universities sort of reach across to work together. It's a very novel, a very supportive, and a very um, nurturing environment. And it takes a long time. And there are people there to lift you up when you run into these problems. And so we're hopeful that the next generation of vaccines will have these better um, attributes and, and make it simpler going forward. I would like to, um, I should like to take a minute, a moment to thank our distinguished panel for an incredibly insightful discussion tonight. Thank you again to the members of this panel. Thank you all for coming out to Wistar um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening.